Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. It's all about total Bitcoin, total decentralization, total freedom, about the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history. My very special guest is Stefan Snigirev. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate really your, you know, your commitment, your everything that you've been doing. I've been following you on the Battle of Bitcoin conference in Munich on June 3rd, 2019. So hello, uh, thank you so much again for coming. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Stefan, uh, could you, I mean, I'm gonna, uh, let, me, let me see. Uh, can I, if I just make a short interview, uh, uh, overview of your, because you got a very fascinating background and mm -hmm. curriculum beta, as we say. <laughs> Uh, you, you did a Doctor of Philosophy at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, uh, mm -hmm. PhD thesis, spectroscopy of ultra-cold RB atoms in a magneto-optical tra trap. It sounds so science yeah. fiction-like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what, uh, Stefan, would you, would you please just introduce yourself a little bit, a little bit of your background, you know, what's your expertise, where, where do you come from, uh, how, what's your path to Bitcoin? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, before I used to work in quantum physics. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, uh, first I worked with rubidium atoms and ultra cold atoms in principle. So uh, it's like when you have atoms and you cool them to uh, 10 to minus nine uh, nano Kelvin temperature. So like almost absolute zero. Uh, and then uh, when they're so cold, so cold, you can do very exciting stuff with them because you completely control them yeah uh, so I was working in that field and uh, or working a little bit in uh, quantum computing as well more you know, on the side of quantum simulators uh, actually because they are uh, a little bit mm, closer to the reality than a digital quantum computer uh, and um, I spent more than 10 years in experimental quantum physics mostly building labs and uh, all the equipment so basically uh, building stuff that didn't exist. Uh, and uh, even though it is very exciting and fascinating, unfortunately, there is one tiny problem that it is not applicable to the real world. So like uh, you work for five years, you build a lab, you make an exciting experiment, then you publish a paper, and then you move forward for the next experiment. And uh, this work that you did uh, will probably be applied in the, <clears throat> in the real world only like in 10, 20 years or so. Uh, so it, uh, in Bitcoin, you see a completely different um, um, behavior. So when people invent something or uh, suggest some interesting idea like a, a signature scheme or something else, uh, people are willing to integrate it right away and start using it right away. So this is really exciting and uh, this is one of the reasons why I decided to switch from quantum physics to Bitcoin. Uh, because uh, I see that I can do stuff and then people will uh, be influenced by uh, what I did. So like they can start using it right away. So this is really what I was missing in quantum physics. Um, and um, yeah, so I started looking into Bitcoin around 2013 uh, and uh, bought some. Uh, before that, I read the white paper because uh, before investing in something, you first need to understand how it works, at least roughly. And I was really, really excited uh, when I understood how exactly it works and how all the uh, beautiful math actually works. Uh, so I was very uh, sure that uh, Bitcoin will survive and will continue rising. So as you see, I was right. right? So back in the days, it was around $300 uh, per Bitcoin or so, and now it's like 10K. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously I got some profit from this investment as well uh, even though it was pretty hard to see how bitcoin was falling from 1000 to 200 uh, but then yeah. <laughs> yeah. i've heard the uh, stories multiple times i mean even the, the you know the the most you know hardcore bit, bit bitcoiners who have been in this space for you know for ages mm -hmm. like for even from the beginning i mean they're all like you know like they all did the same mistakes or they you know maybe they didn't really believe or trust or understand the whole you know the totality of bitcoin so it's funny you know to hear those stories you know even from you know uh, like like super hardcore bitcoiners you know who've been in this space for from the beginning i mean i've been here like for like what three years you know mm -hmm. and uh i guess 
it takes some time and maturity to understand all the facets of Bitcoin, right? Especially for, you know, non-technical or... Uh, yeah, you need to go through all the steps. So you, well, everyone probably goes even through trading a little bit, then they fail miserably and do some money and then uh, they stop. Yeah, then they start looking at different uh, altcoins. And uh, I would say that some of the projects look even interesting, but uh, eventually I switch completely to Bitcoin, uh, no other crap. Uh, and... Mm, yeah, so everyone lost something. Everyone uh, probably had to spend some money when they didn't want to, like when the Bitcoin was on the bottom. Uh, well, and now we just need to stack our sets. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Look, yeah. Uh, Stepan, I mean, I have some uh, core topics in, you know, just general open questions about privacy, security, ease of use. I'm also uh, excited to hear about your perspective, your thoughts, or what are you working on right now when it comes to, you know, I mean, my, you know, my personal vision or intention or desire is really that uh, we reach s slowly or exponentially faster <laughs> this critical mass adoption. And, you know, the, the technical, technological are, you know, the applications are not really yet so, because I'm helping a lot of people, but still, you know, even after so many multiple, you know, explanations, they still have problems even with the Trezor Hardware wallet. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter whether they're 40 years old or 65 years old, you know? So do you think we can make the applications really more intuitive, easy, a little bit more by default when it comes you know to this fungibility coin joint stuff privacy mm -hmm. security do you think are we on this way on this path um yeah so at the moment it is uh, really a huge problem the usability of uh, all the bitcoin stuff because it is written by technical people for technical people mostly <laughs> uh and uh, i cannot even imagine that i would explain uh my mom for example how to work with electron wallet or bitcoin core for example yeah so uh, i would probably choose something uh way simpler than that maybe a clear or something but uh, i see that uh, actually work uh, well i mean progress is happening there so more and more mostly mobile wallets uh, look more user friendly i would say than uh, than desktop wallets uh, so uh, they already look pretty much as a normal online banking application and i think uh, in sense of uh, user experience and uh, interface this is more or less the right way to go because basically uh, your Bitcoin wallet is a like banking application, right? So yeah. it just manages your funds. Uh, so if we can in include like the uh, normal behavior uh, in the apps that is uh, common for online banking, then people will probably uh, feel okay with that. And in that sense, uh, the hardware wallet should work uh, in a similar way. Like uh, right now in the bank, you can actually ask for the, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, device where you put a, a card to confirm mm -hmm. to authorize the transaction or something uh, so something similar to that can be done uh, in another thing is that with the mass adoption uh, you don't only have more user base but you have also the larger attack service because more attackers start looking into the into the field and they understand that more and more people actually own bitcoin so uh, there will be more hacks and um, at the moment I think that every hacker that writes, uh, I don't know, tro Trojans or other malware probably includes there the uh, script that will try to look for uh, Bitcoin wallets uh, files, for example, mm -hmm. Electrum wallets or mm -hmm. Bitcoin Core. Uh, so I think that uh, we do need hardware wallets that are more user friendly and um, also more secure, more mature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, regarding what, what we are doing and uh, why we started doing this, uh, actually exactly that. So uh, I was not very happy, like, like back in the days, I was not very happy about the hardware wallet that exists uh, existed on the market, uh, mostly because they are not air gapped and I'm extremely scared uh, yeah. to put to connect something to my computer, uh, especially over USB because it is a universal um, bus. Yeah. So I started writing my own thing and I also met my business partner, Morris, uh, on the uh, Breaking Bitcoin conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was also uh, thinking about the same, but more from the business perspective. So he wanted someone 
to build a hardware wallet to actually be useful. Yeah, so, uh, and now we uh, switch to something uh, a little bit more, um, ah, yeah, right. So, uh, more is, is somewhere there. Um, we uh, decided to do something a little bit more than that. Uh, in particular, we decided to build a uh, framework and a toolbox for developers to build more different hardware wallets. Because uh, what we need is, uh, we need more uh, different um, wallets with different security models. We need more people that are trying to build more user-friendly uh, and um, easy to use uh, and more uh, yeah, hardware wallets that also has probably more features like CoinJoin or Lightning Network and many uh, other interesting applications that are happening. So uh, by default, by default, I mean, is that possible? Will we make this like easier by default? You know, it's, it's really, um, I mean, using Wasabi, for example, that's not for newbie. I mean, definitely not. Yeah, for you newbie. need to understand what is happening there. So how I see it is, uh, well, you can hide all the complexity um, under the hood, for example, you just can have a uh, normal uh, kind of colorful background from red to green, you know, uh, that is basically a measure of your anonymity uh, or privacy, you know, some kind of privacy measure. And then you can have a, a button please increase my privacy. And then under the hood, it kind of finds what uh, trans UTXOs to mix and how many times to mix. Uh, so, uh, because, well, frankly speaking, uh, for me, just using one coin join transaction uh, would be already enough. For example, I want to send you some money, but I don't want you to know um, how much I own. And I don't, uh, I'm not scared about, about very, um, very complicated analysis tools that uh, this coin analysis uh, guys are using. I just care that you personally can't just go to blockstream.info uh, and see that, okay, this guy sent me, uh, I don't know, one milli Bitcoin, but I see that the input was like uh, 10 Bitcoins or so. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to mix that with other people and yeah. uh, just to make it a little bit harder for you to understand how much I own. Uh, and then uh, it is already much better. So I think that um, what we can do, we can include by default uh, certain privacy uh, and security measures uh, that uh, just raise the bar a little bit. And that will be already way better than what we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Uh, what, what, what is the time frame? I mean, <laughs> this kind of development, I mean, what, what, where do you see, I mean, you think in the next couple of years, it's going to be sort of mass uh, suited or, you know, newbie suited? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to take like more than a year or two? Or? Uh, no, I think that uh, roughly one year, uh, one, two years should be enough to have uh, very user-friendly applications. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, in particular, I hope that our company will, will also contribute into that. Uh, for example, what we are working on right now is the amount of signature and how to make amount of signature more user-friendly because right mm -hmm. now it is a nightmare, especially if you are using Bitcoin Core, uh, then you need to go through all the command line uh, hell. Uh, with Electrum, it is a little bit easier, but uh, I think that no other real software wallets support multi-signature at the moment. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, Coupe is doing something but uh, I failed setting it up, so probably mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not, the, not the trend as well. Um, yeah, so especially with uh, hardware wallets, for example. Uh, Multi-signature support in hardware wallets is uh, really a disaster. Trezor currently is the only wallet that supports multi-signature properly, but to, you know, to have benefits from the multi-signature, you need actually devices from multiple vendors. So just using Trezor is not enough. Uh, so ideally, you want to have Trezor, Ledger, and Cold Card, and maybe our wallet uh, that work together, and you use uh, I don't know two or four, three or four multi-signature setup. Uh, but uh, Ledger, for example, uh, is not able to display your multi-signature receiving address, and it is not able to say uh, which of the output is the change output. So you always uh, you don't have enough information uh, on the hardware wallet itself to kind of be secure. Uh, code cards implementation of multi-signature is pretty buggy at the moment. Uh, so it, when I tried to use it, it worked in 
uh, one setup of four or something. So I tried native SegWit, I tried nested SegWit, legacy, and so on. Uh, and only in one of them it worked. Uh, but uh, they introduced uh, multi-signature only recently, so I hope that they will fix all these problems and it will be... Um, well, it, it will actually work. Uh, yeah, and um, so we need to fix like uh, problems on both sides, uh, even with multi-signature. On the software side, we need more user-friendly uh, application. And on the uh, hardware side, we also need more uh, multi-signature integration. And I think it's more like a, a chicken and egg problem. People don't use multi-signature because it is hard, and vendors are not implementing multi-signature because people are not asking for it. Yeah, so we need to start moving in that direction. Uh, then also CoinJoin is extremely interesting and uh, at the moment there are only a few uh, wallets that support it. So ideally there should be more and ideally there should be a hardware wallet integration as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also what we are working on with uh, Trezor, the protocol that uh, allows to do coin joins with hardware wallets securely. Uh, it looks like uh, everything can be solved, so we will have it. Um, yeah, and then we also need to integrate the Lightning into everything. Mm -hmm. right? Then mm -hmm. we have the full stack, more or less. Uh, you've been on uh, Stephen Lapierre's uh, podcast too, right? And Peter McCormick's, mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah, wonderful interview. Uh, be, and now that I'm thinking of Steve, Stephen Lapierre, he, he once said there is this progression of newbies coming into this space. Okay, first they, you know, they go on the exchange, buy some Satoshi or Bitcoin, they leave it there. Either they get wrecked or they do, you know, hear from trusted people. It's like, hey, you know what? Get yourself a hardware wallet. So they get to some hardware wallet. Let's just say, I'm, I'm really a big fan of Trezor. I mean, it's because mm -hmm. it's really top notch. Yeah, it's user friend, right? So, yeah. And then, you know, the next progression would be, and that is something I haven't done myself, full note. <laughs> this is like okay you know i'm like okay i'm exiting already because um uh, it wouldn't be a problem i can i could get myself a casa hodl and it's allegedly it's like really plug and play this is what i'm wishing for for everybody plug and play but still you know it costs like 300 euros and then i'm not sure whether the average person on top of that uh there's like different opinions what's the subscription fee for like additionally $300 mm -hmm. per year on subscription. What's, what's yeah, the benefit? Weird. What is the extra benefit? I still didn't understand like, what if I don't have the subscription, can I just, you know, buy the Casa huddle, plug it uh, in and I have a full node. And anyway. I didn't really look into, into Casa, so I don't know what they, so they take, subscription probably for the key store. So like one of the keys they have uh, yeah. in there. So they are kind of semi-custodian uh, thing. Uh, they they protect one of the keys. Yeah, the exactly, exactly. But okay, I mean, what are the chances, the probability? Uh, so yeah, I can uh, make a calculation. <laughs> <laughs> so. you, you can you can do uh, everything yourself ideally right so at the yeah. moment it is very challenging and it is more like for technical and unix style people uh so yeah well, the desktop app that we are so uh just a short uh, i don't know not spoiler announcement probably uh <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it, we are working it. on <laughs> yeah, we are working on the uh, desktop app. Uh, I think that uh, you, I can even send you the link. Uh, mm -hmm. It's in our GitHub repository uh, called uh, Spectre Desktop. Uh, and this is basically a tiny web interface around uh, Bitcoin Core. So mm -hmm. the problem with Bitcoin Core is that it is uh, it is a wonderful daemon. It is a wonderful like uh, code uh, and it is a re reference implementation. So it can um, do like uh, sync the blockchain, verify all the blocks, verify all the signatures and so on. But as soon as it, um, we are talking about the GUI and the user experience, yeah, it is pretty terrible. Uh, so. Um, and sometimes the, it is missing certain features. For example, at the moment, it is very hard to use Bitcoin Core in watch-only mode, even though it, it is already possible. And with a command line interface, you can do even uh, watch-only Bitcoin Core node uh, that uh, can talk to your hardware wallets uh, to do like uh, either multi-signature or just uh, simple transactions. Uh, but again, uh, everything through command line. Uh, and uh, what our app uh, is doing, it's just uh, 
making a, a small interface uh, that makes it convenient to use these features. In particular, we are focusing on the um, single or multi-signature wallets with hardware wallets. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we are uh, supporting code cards, working on the code card support and on the, uh, our uh, duties of hardware wallet. Basically, the hardware wallet that you can uh, buy components uh, of the shelf, just in the normal electronic stores, put them together as a Lego without any soldering or whatever. Uh, just uh, upload the firmware to it. It works as a drag and drop of the file to like a mounted USB drive, and then start using it in the completely air gap mode. Uh, so, but that's for technical the, people, uh, step uh, up, right? Yeah, it, this is for technical people, okay. but uh, <laughs> the, the desktop, well, mm -hmm. How technical? Not not super technical. So I think that anyone. So the idea is that my business partner Morris and another business partner Ben, who are not very technical, uh, mm -hmm. should be able to do it by themselves just by uh, reading this short instruction. Like okay, um, by this put this together, drag and drop, you're done. Here just run the app. Mm, and it already has the Bitcoin core, it is syncing the blockchain, it is verifying everything and you can interact uh, with it uh, through the convenient interface. Uh, if I can share the screen, uh, by the way, do you, are you recording the video as well for the podcast? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so then I can probably uh, share the, the screen. Right. Give, just give me a second, I will. Sure prepare everything and they will just show you what how roughly it uh what roughly it looks like so map spectre desktop um maybe i have it here okay um yeah so sure sure so now you should see it so i just run the app Mm -hmm. Hopefully it works. Wow. Nah. Okay, yeah. Uh, and basically here it is connecting to my Bitcoin core node. Uh, so this is just a uh, settings to talk to it. it. It should fill it by default by itself, so you don't need to do anything. And then you have like paired devices, like a, a code card and uh, like hardware wallets. And you also have wallets, like a normal wallet, multi-signature wallet, and so on. And what you see, uh, you see the, the transaction list, you can uh, get the uh, address address, uh, like receiving address, you can send, uh, and so on. So it's like pretty minimal. Uh, but uh, the important thing here is that, for example, if you want to create a multi-signature wallet, uh, you just go through the normal uh, like uh, wizard or something. I want a multi-signature wallet. Uh, I want to use, let's say, two of two. Uh, this is my first device that I already paired. This is my second device. Uh, and then, uh, what keys to use, it already chooses the appropriate keys and then I create the wallet and I have a wallet that I can use to receive uh, the Bitcoins. And ideally, uh, this uh, interface should work uh, with uh, AirGet hardware wallets like code card and our do-it-yourself thing. Uh, and um, you want to go to the command line at any point. So, uh, for example, when you want to send the money uh, let's say I want to send the money to this wallet that I just created. Uh, I go to send, uh, I put the amount, uh, oops, and it is still in development. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you but, see that it's But did I understand you correctly, uh, uh, Stefan, that you, this, this coin mixing, the coin join uh, function, you, you can eventually then build it as a default into this desktop uh, application? Yes, yes. So this is uh, something that we want to add a little bit later. So at the moment we are not, uh, we are focusing on multi-signature more and then the next step will be a coin join. Uh, so the um, how it should work. So right now, you know, you can talk to the Wasabi wallet from the from the Wasabi wallet, you can talk to the Wasabi server uh, and then uh, register your inputs and uh, outputs there and then participate in the coin join. Uh, and um, uh, we can do, we can integrate the same into this interface. 
Uh, and we can also create uh, different coin join pools for uh, normal people using a single key wallet. And for example, uh, the uh, coin join mixing pool that uh, uses two or three multi signature, for example. Because the problem with this multi signature setup is that if you are trying to participate in the coin join, then everyone see the, sees that, okay, this is the input that was a multi signature, and this is the output that uh, is multi signature. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, and every, if everyone else is using a single key, then you are not anonymizing anything. Actually, you don't get any privacy there. So what you need, oh, you need to mix okay. your coins with other people that use similar setups. Oh. Uh, so you use two of three, then other people that are also using two of three should go together, and then uh, the coin join will actually do the work. So that all the transactions will be safe. Everything will change when we have the Schnorr signatures. So with Schnorr signatures, uh, multi-sig uh, can be combined into, like, it will look exactly the same uh, way as a normal single key uh, action. So then there, one can, can work within the same pool. But at the moment, you need to make, like, the, the, uh, to distinguish, like, to participate only with people that are using a similar setup. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, the next uh, thing in the list that we want to work. And ideally, okay. it, it should be just, like, a button, please increase my privacy a little bit. Or, yeah, I'm super paranoid, I want to control everything, and then you have a... Uh, uh, complete coin control, but uh, like mm -hmm. such that both technical people would be happy and uh, normal people would be happy. <laughs> okay, yeah. got it. Um, uh, just for educational purpose, I mean, you said you know uh, there's always a lot of technical jargon, uh, you know, technical oh, terminology. Yeah. It's about sure, Schnorr some, signature, taproot, grab, graph root. I mean, can mm -hmm. is it is it possible if it's you know if it doesn't doesn't take too much time? Is it possible like to make a short distinction or explanation of what these are and what are the challenges? Because I want to really sometimes understand what are the challenges when, for example, you or Adam back you know talk about all these problems. I'm like, this is Chinese for me. It's like you know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it would be good, you know, for newbies. Like, what, what's the purpose, or what is, you know, of these? Uh, okay, things? so I can uh, give a very uh, short introduction about the Schnorr signatures. Uh, so um, first, why they are called Schnorr signatures? Because there was a guy Schnorr. I mean, he is uh, still alive, uh, teaching in Frankfurt, but pretty old, uh, who invented this wonderful, very nice, and beautiful signature scheme. Uh, and he patented this uh, this signature scheme such that anyone who wants to use it needs to pay royalty fees, right? Uh, so community was not very happy about that because, uh, come on, who wants to uh, um, to pay for the for math? Uh, math should be free and uh, and the knowledge in general. Uh, so uh, they decided to build a scheme that will be. Uh, like an ugly version of the Schnorr signatures that would be not uh, under the patent of Schnorr, such that uh, everyone could use it for free. And this is how ECDSA was born. So elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So unfortunately, it is just an ugly and less, not as secure uh, signature scheme comparing mm -hmm. to Schnorr. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there is no security proof for CDSA, but there is for Schnorr, N doesn't matter. Uh, so, and then um, we were stuck with that for 20 years. Uh, and uh, recently the patent expired and now everyone can actually oh. use Schnorr signatures. And finally, uh, we uh, start getting it into, started thinking about getting it into Bitcoin and started writing the documentation and uh, started using all the nice features that, um, that uh, it enables because it is a truly wonderful scheme where all, all this key aggregation and uh, signature uh, aggregation and other stuff uh, uh, actually works. Uh, for example, how the multi-signature works at the moment. Uh, you have, I don't need to explain private keys, right? Uh, yeah, I think I mean, it's more I guess, or less clear. Yeah, we have private keys and public keys. Yeah. yeah, so we use a private key to prove that we uh, control the coins. Uh, and um, so what we can do, what we do at the moment with the multi-signature. Uh, we say that, okay, these Bitcoins can be spent only if I provide the signatures from this, this, and this key. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, let's say, uh, 
if I provide two signatures out of three keys. Yeah? And then uh, what every node does when you actually make a transaction, uh, they verify that, okay, yeah, this signature corresponds to one of these uh, three keys, this signature corresponds to another one, so there are two of three, uh, everything is valid, we go through. Uh, so what is possible with Schnorr signatures? With Schnorr, you can uh, make it such that uh, you can combine the keys together. So the public key is just a point on the elliptic curve. So you can just add these points together and uh, the result will be another point. Uh, so basically this means that your multi-signature scheme, instead of saying to everyone, I'm using these three keys, uh, you're saying, I'm using the key. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to know how I created this key. And in reality, what you do, you just add together three keys and then you get your final key. Uh, and the same works with the signature. So you create three signatures, uh, you add them together and you get the final signature that works, that is valid for the final key. Uh, and this means that no one knows and no one cares what exactly is the setup that you are using. So if you are using seven of 11 multi-signature with uh, different keys in different vaults uh, under the ground in the banks in different countries, uh, great. Uh, but at the moment, everyone knows that you are using this crazy scheme. Uh, and with Schnorr signatures, no one knows, no one cares. Everyone sees that, okay, uh, there was a key, here is the signature, everything is valid, uh, the transaction is valid. Yeah, this is wow. really Wow, that would benefit. be fantastic. I mean, if that, mm -hmm. if that becomes, this is what, I mean, this is, I think, the ultimate thing in Bitcoin when it comes to total, like, by default privacy. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what we're waiting for? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm really waiting for the uh, for the, the next uh, soft fork where we will get Schnorr signatures. Uh, also, the taproot. Uh, so the idea of the taproot uh, is that um, well, if you think about the scripts that we are currently using, for example, Lightning Network uh, or um, what else? Uh, I don't know some uh, crazy scripts that are used in the custodian systems, like with the time locks and everything. Um, all this. Uh, complications and all this uh, kind of complicated uh, structure of the script is only uh, is used only if something bad is happening. For example, in, in Lightning Network, if the other party is misbehaving, you need to penalize it. Uh, if the other party is not responding, then you need to close the channel, then you broadcast this thing. So basically all these uh, complications in the script are only to uh, to work if something goes wrong. But normally everything goes okay. Everything goes right, everyone is collaborating. So, uh, but the scripts are always there. Mm -hmm. So what the Taproot uh, allows you to do is uh, to build this interesting structure such that if uh, everything goes right and all the parties are collaborating, then everyone will see only a single key and single signature. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, nothing different from a normal, uh, normal transaction. And only if something is going wrong, some, someone is not responding or misbehaving, then you can say, hey, actually, this key is not just the key. It is the key plus this um, tree of scripts. And here is one of the passes of the script. And this is what should happen when something goes wrong. So this means that um, after the new soft fork with Schnorr and uh, Taproot, all the transaction will look the same on the blockchain. All normal transaction, all like wow. uh, everyday transaction will look wow. the same. And yeah. only if something is going wrong, then you uh, you disclose that, uh, okay, there was this secret branch in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it is a huge benefit for, for privacy. And this is also uh, saving a lot of uh, space and computational power for full nodes. Uh, because you don't need to put all this data into the blockchain. You only provide this data when something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it. Wow, very exciting. What about this? Uh, we don't need to go into detail, but this gra graft root, or was it called gra graft, whatever? What it was gra called? Graft root, uh, uh, frankly speaking, I didn't uh, look into that carefully, so okay, I can't, then, really, can't, okay. can't really say anything about that. No, but that was, that was awesome. Uh, so, Stefan, uh, something I, uh, yeah, just about the Trezor, that something concerns me. And I've heard that from other people that uh, in the latest update, where they did whatever 1.8 something updates, a very minor update they did, 
Um, the Tracer One, the Model One, they he asks you literally. I mean, you have to type in the twenty-four words of the monomic phrase into the into the keyboard. I mean, into the that that is like uh -oh. that is not. And is I mean the Model One, not the Model T. I I've never worked with Model T, so and I'm like this is not safe. I mean, this mm -hmm. should be like, you know, some, I mean, first of all, it's asking you all the 24 words. If it was like, you know, like I would, I would have done it. I mean, if, if I, um, you know, from a practical standpoint, I would just, you know, just see on the display. Okay. Is this like verify, is this the fifth seed word, you know, mm -hmm. but not that, you, you know, he's asking you like, you know, in, in, in irregular consecutive order, uh, whatever number 11 and then you type in the 11th seed word into the into the mm -hmm. keyboard mm -hmm. so what do you think about this this is not really yeah, so this is this is basically just the problem of the user experience pro user interface problem yeah uh, so uh similar so what i don't like about uh trezor model one uh from the very beginning that you need to type your pin on the keyboard uh, so they you know every time you uh, you log in uh it shuffles the uh the numbers and then you use your normal keyboards yeah. to enter the pin code yeah uh, so the same probably happens when you need to recover your wallet. So uh, m m I'm guessing that what you're describing, what happened uh, during the firmware update, uh, all the, uh, basically you, mm, the mnemonic phrase, the recovery phrase, the, 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 the key that was stored on the treasure uh, was erased. So like it is a complete wipe of the device and then you need to recover. So, uh, and the you know, Trezor Model 1 only has two buttons and nothing else, right? So uh, it would be a nightmare to enter your mnemonic phrase using just these two buttons because for every letter you need to, to press the button, I don't know, 20 times and to find the right letter and then you go further and so on. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's why they're asking for random words and then you are typing it on the keyboard. So this is really a threat. I think it is a, a huge problem. Uh, and uh, mostly because of the limitations of the hardware itself. So I think that for Trezor T, what they do, they have a uh, tiny touch screen. So in principle, you can actually type the words, right? So I think that when you recover, you actually have the this uh, uh, keyboard, you know, like the old style, uh, uh, the display? Old, uh, old phones. Yeah. yeah, so, like, yeah. yeah so on the display, you have like uh, one, two, three, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. So you can <laughs> click actually on every uh, button, then you need to, to choose the right letter, and then oh. you actually can type the, um, actually can type the mnemonic phrase. But uh, yeah, this is the uh, general problem of all hardware wallets at the moment, that they mm -hmm. try to make it as cheap as possible, even though it is not super cheap. It's yeah. Still around 100 euro, right? Mm, but uh, this means that you have hardware limitation. Like you have only two buttons on Ledger, you have only two buttons on Trezor One, you have a tiny touch screen on Trezor T. Uh, on the cold card, you have a kind of numeric uh, keypad. Uh, so again, uh, coming back to uh, the do-it-yourself thing that we are uh, we are putting out, it, it actually has the screen that is um, from iPhone 4 or something, so like a four inch screen, uh, mm -hmm. where you can actually type everything you want there on like a normal phone style keyboard. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, there the user, the user experience is pretty good. Uh, but I think that uh, it was also mostly because um, yeah, this problem on Model 1 and uh, Ledger was mostly because it it's pretty old products, right? When, yeah. hard, when no one really knew how the hardware wallet should uh, operate. So no, it was just the first tries to create something that uh, moves your secret keys away from your computer. Uh, and I think that, uh, for example, first uh, Ledger wallet was... It didn't even have a screen. It was just a dongle that you put into the USB. And then it became uh, clear for everyone that you do need a trusted screen and trusted uh, user input such that you can actually confirm on the device and verify on the device. Uh, because yeah, if your computer is compromised, then it can show you anything. Yeah. Uh, and now it is moving more into the uh, better user experience and uh, like more into the user-friendly way uh, 
such that you can actually type also your mnemonic in the uh, in the wallet. And uh, I think that we will also see a huge uh, improvement in the hardware wallet field over the years. Uh, um, recently, I was in uh, Bitcoin 2019 conference in San Francisco, and they saw plenty of interesting projects, uh, hardware wallet projects. Really? Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, Cobo Vault, for example, the Chinese guys are doing this uh, QR code uh, error gapped hardware wallet unfortunately they don't support uh, multi-signature with other wallets so i and uh, um it, they are kind of partially closed source or something so mm -hmm. i'm not sure that i would use this wallet but in principle the project is pretty interesting uh and uh, plenty of others some of them are using bluetooth that i'm not a huge fan of some of them are using the larger screen so uh, it's getting better i think that uh, over two years uh, we will get more interesting hardware wallets, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I must admit, okay, uh, you know, going back to that progression after, you know, exchange hardware wallet, then full node, full node, then connected to hardware wallets. So these are, you know, the sort of the evolution, <laughs> I guess, in every ones, but it's, you know, it's just too much, it's overwhelming. And it, a hardware wallet is better than nothing. I mean, it's still better than nothing, right? But uh, the whole purpose becomes obsolete because the right. I mean, starting with this hardware wallet, with its trezor, whatever. Um, the whole purpose is to sort of, un, sort of uh, separate or isolate it from from the keyboard, yeah. right? And yes. But then, what's the sense of it if I have to type in all the twenty-four words in whatever order? into the keyboard what if it's compromised then i'm you know i'm screwed right yes. even though it is shuffled uh, it doesn't uh, add any security because you can easily brute force the order of the words and the ugly thing is that uh, the recovery phrase actually has a checksum so you don't even need to look into the blockchain to uh, find the right order of the words you can just uh, switch them together and find okay checksum works so this this is the thing um, yeah, this is not uh, super safe, but uh, I think that what Trezor guys are saying is that uh, Trezor Model 1 is their um, entry point, entry uh, entry product or something. So like it is cheap, it is uh, not as great in sense of user experience, uh, but they keep selling it because it is cheap. And uh, me personally, I would recommend using Trezor T because uh, there you, uh, yeah, from this, it is, uh, it is way better because when you connect Trezor T to the, uh, to the computer, uh, it, um, it doesn't talk to the computer uh, until you unlock it. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, before there was a vulnerability that uh, allowed a complete uh, well allowed to extract the, uh, your secret key from Trezor using glitching if you mm -hmm. just connect it uh, mm -hmm. over computer. So now uh, Trezor T doesn't talk to the computer, doesn't appear as a device until you um, unlock it. And also a recovery phrase, uh, you enter also on the screen of the device. And in principle, just it is cute and nice and really <laughs> in yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Compared, uh, Stephen, compared to all the other hardware wallets that are out there right now for the mm -hmm. newbies, I mean, I don't, a hard, I mean like for, the cold card is would would you consider cold that as... is still still too cypherpunk i would say yeah yeah uh, so it is also like uh, the product that uh, rodolfo and uh, peter built for themselves mm -hmm. uh, if everyone else disappears uh, and uh, yeah you you feel it uh, like you feel all this uh kind of uh, personality of rodolfo uh, <laughs> in the product itself yeah <laughs> And I'm not saying that it is bad. It is actually great. It is the first uh, hardware wallet that can be used in a completely air gap scenario when you don't need to connect it to computer ever. So this yeah. is a huge security benefit. Uh, but uh, the form factor and the user experience is still a little bit too cypherpunk. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the moment, uh, I would recommend Trezor T. And hopefully, uh, after some time, I would recommend our hardware wallet. <laughs> when would that release be like approximately uh so i think that it will be uh next year around uh summer autumn uh because uh well maybe even later because um uh, at the moment we are still on the um, prototype ish phase 
uh, and uh, we are working more into the uh, like uh, building more like a um, hardware platform, not just a hardware wallet, uh, such that actually developers can experiment with, uh, with the platform to build new stuff around it. Uh, and uh, in general, just manufacturing the uh, custom chip and uh, the boards and the device uh, takes a while. Uh, but um, even before that, uh, we really hope that we can provide the do-it-yourself kits uh, that people can order either from us or from other, mm -hmm. uh, from just general electronic stores and they can try our firmware and ideally it should be uh, easy to do. So it's more like uh, buying uh, furniture from IKEA, right? So okay, like the IKEA, components that you just really... Components you just put together. Uh, actually, maybe I can even show to you how roughly it works. So you... Luckily, okay, I have it next to me. So this is the boards that we are using at the moment. This is the developer board. So you see the screen that is pretty large uh, and uh, you have the microcontroller and you can buy it from a normal electronic store. So it's not mm -hmm. our board, it's just a developer board that is commonly available. Uh, then you can buy a bunch of other things uh, like, um, this uh, is another board that I bought from another store. This is a uh, QR code scanner. Mm -hmm. And this is just an adapter board that I also buy. So basically you buy three pieces that mm -hmm. uh, can be put together just um, like, like this. Okay, so pretty self-explanatory, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, in here also, <laughs> also like this. Huh? Great. Then it is a little bit bulky, but uh, you don't need to solder anything. Uh, and then you can just uh, power it on. Um, maybe I can do it uh, ideally from the power bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and you have the, well, you need to uh, upload the firmware so I can now share the screen uh, again. So when I connected, sorry, this is still here. Uh, when I connected the hardware wallet to the computer, uh, oh, I have so many windows, I'm sorry. Uh, it appeared as a USB drive. So you see this, this guy. So when I disconnect the, uh, the wallet, it disappears. When yeah. I connect it, uh, it appears. Uh, so, and uh, then the only thing to, uh, you need to do to upload the firmware to it, you just copy paste the firmware file uh, to this, uh, this drive and that's it. Uh, and then after this, uh, you can actually start using it and uh, you don't need to connect it to the computer anymore. Uh, so it uses QR code scanner to scan the unsigned transaction. Then it shows you all the information about actually tra the transaction. You sign it and then you scan the QR code with the signature or on the computer. So ideally it works like, uh, like this. You scan and then you scan again. That's it. Wow. Um, so Mm -hmm. This is uh, so the idea, and uh, hopefully uh, it will be done by the end of this week. Um, because, uh, yeah, because uh, Morris wants to go to Baltic Honey Badger and actually demo it. Yeah, I'm thinking of going there too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then we uh -huh. continue working on that because I do understand that it takes time before we actually can manufacture the final product because yeah. obviously we don't want to ship this bulky thing. Uh, you actually want to ship something that looks like a normal phone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it takes time. But before that, uh, you still will be able to use uh, our prototype uh, that hopefully will be um, easy enough to assemble by yourself. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Um, let me go back to that point that I made with about the Trezor one. I mean, do you think, are there, are, are there any precautionary measures um, one can take after you know you type in all these seed words mm -hmm. i mean is there a way to sort of cleanse <laughs> your system a little bit after um, you do things okay like so that? i would say that um before you start entering your recovery phrase 
uh, you should probably uh, boot into some kind of live CD or something. Uh, or it, uh, for example, the best way is to use tails, but it takes time to set everything up. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I would say that, you know, if I have, if I would have a really large amount of money on Trezor and I would see that I need to do something like this, I would buy um, Raspberry Pi or something or like a really cheap laptop that doesn't have any Wi-Fi or whatever. Uh, I would recover it and maybe then I need to just destroy it, but maybe it is way too much. Uh, well, uh, I think the easiest is actually to uh, to boot from the uh, live USB or live CD or something like uh, Ubuntu live CD or something, mm -hmm. and uh, then set Trezor up there, uh, and then just reboot your normal system. Because I would say that uh, there is a higher risk that your uh, normal um, computer is compromised, your normal OS is compromised, and you don't even know about that. Uh, and if you just boot into the live CD, it's probably a fresh, uh, fresh operation system that doesn't have uh, anything there. And yeah, after you are done, you can also just uh, destroy the USB drive. Oh, got it. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, um, Evan. Um, I think. Oh, I'm, uh, yeah. I think that there is another way. Yeah. Um, so, what if you? Uh, generate a new uh, key on the treasure mm -hmm. and you move all your funds to that one so when you are generating the key you don't need to um, recover right so you don't need to type anything so you always see the keys that uh, treasure generated for you, uh, you know, the, 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 oh. the the words Okay, are you talking like uh, about like uh, like sort of creating a, a new wallet, a hidden wallet with a passphrase? Is that the same thing you're talking, or is that something uh -huh. else? Because uh, well, no, one no, could no, do I, that too. I, you know, we, you know, one could. But, but uh, you also you also type your password on the keyboard, right? <laughs> Um, so the the, the pin the oh yeah the yeah yeah the, yeah. the, the, the passphrase right. yeah yeah the password. Um, no, I I was thinking about just uh, set up the fresh wallet from scratch, uh, mm -hmm. such that Trezor generates the new recovery phrase uh, by itself, uh, such that you only write it down on a piece of paper, um, and then you need to move all your funds to this mm -hmm. uh, Trezor somehow. Uh, but how can you do it uh, without having a second trezor? I don't know. It is challenging. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I would recommend to migrate to Trezor T, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Until we have other, you know, options like yours, which are then yeah. really, you know, intuitive, easy, uh, and, and user friendly, you know, this is, once we have that, I think it's much, much easier just to give people the instruction here. This is your hardware wallet. This, this is all the instructions you need to follow and that's it. You know, otherwise people are so challenged and overwhelmed and um, mm -hmm. overburdened. Uh, yeah. Did you, uh, you, you did uh, try the Trezor T, right? No, never, never, no. no. I uh, myself have a model one. I myself have a model uh. one. Yeah, ah, I see. Uh, you mind. definitely should because uh, it is not, uh, uh, well, it is a little bit more expensive, uh, yeah. but the user experience is way, way better. So okay. I, uh, that's why I, I also have, uh, well, I have all hardware wallets uh, that I could get. Uh, and uh, on the, uh, let's say for my uh, daily operations, I actually use Trader T. Uh, so like to log in into uh, like a, I'm using it as a password manager as uh, um, 2FA uh, thingy uh, and uh, yeah I even store some uh, everyday uh, mm -hmm. well I, I used to store my everyday money there now I'm using my ugly prototype for that uh, but uh, still I, I feel like uh, Trezor T is the most user friendly one. So okay, I would mm -hmm. recommend uh, that at the moment. Okay, yeah. are there any other products you've taken a look at, like Bitbox or something, like, uh, like Bitcoin only? I'm not. Or... I'm not a fan of Bitbox because of a few reasons. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, their first hardware wallet uh, was 
terrible from security perspective because it doesn't even have a screen. Uh, and uh, there was a review by Salem Rashid about security of the beatbox where he showed that uh, the guys made a very, um, very bad mistakes uh, on the on the technical level, on the cryptographic side. So uh, I wouldn't trust, uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't trust uh, Bitbox uh, as a hardware wallet. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, it's my personal opinion and I'm not saying that they are bad guys. I know that yeah. there are plenty of talented people and so on, but I personally would not use uh, Bitbox. Now they have a Bitbox version two, mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that it looks, um, okay-ish, but uh, it still has a pretty small screen. So in that sense, uh, it is pretty similar to Ledger. Um, no, not really. Then KeepKey is a clone of Trezor. Uh, cold card is interesting, but not uh, super user friendly. Uh, but uh, if you're if you want an air get hardware awarded, then cold card is a good choice. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Uh, Cobo Vault uh, is a little bit unknown and not really working together with the community. So they are not uh, integrating the multi-signature, for example, and uh, they have multi-signature only together with their own app that is a security risk. Um, and I don't see them uh, like contributing into the standards mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, who else? Uh, what, what else do we have? Um, um. So. Well, these are the most popular ones. I would not go with the unknown hardware wallet uh, just yeah. because uh, less people are using it. Uh, the, this means that it is less tested. This means that the vulnerabilities there will be for a longer time. This means that it exposes you uh, as an attack target for longer. And so in that sense, um, Ledger is uh, better in sense of uh, hardware security because they're using a secure element, uh, but sometimes they screw up on the protocol level that is a little bit set. Uh, Trezor is great on the protocol level, so they uh, really have a very strong team that is uh, testing everything that they can do, but they have limitations on the hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and Code cards is like a mix of two, so something in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using Trezor crypto library. Uh, they have a secure key storage that is not exactly a secure element because cryptography is still happening on the main microcontroller. So yeah, something in the middle. But in principle, all three of them are pretty much equal. And I would say that all other hardware wallets at the moment are a little bit below uh, that on the security level. Yeah. All right. Great, Uh Let me ask you for just the last few minutes. Um, do you want to talk about quantum at all, or? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we can talk. Uh, so I can, I can say what I think that it is, it is important to do at the moment. So there is a lot of confusion uh, in the yeah, about this quantum uh, security and quantum. Uh, so like quantum computers break in classical cryptography. Uh, there are a few reasons. Uh, first, there are quantum secure altcoins that are really trying to push the paranoia level up because it is their marketing. So they get more people and more evaluation if everyone is scared of, uh, about quantum computers breaking classical cryptography. Then another thing is marketing from the companies that are working on quantum uh, computing, like uh, D-Wave and uh, what Google is trying to do in their labs, uh, like, um, making better uh, artificial intelligence with quantum computers and uh, Microsoft is working in this direction and so on. Uh, so for them, it is important to show that they are working on something valuable and that they are making progress. Uh, for scientists in academia, where I came from, it is also important because this way you can get money for the grant. So how it normally happens, you think, okay, what is like, uh, the current uh, trends. Okay, quantum computing. How can we uh, write our um, uh, application for the grant such that it involves quantum computing such that we can kind of uh, claim that we are improving this field? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so then now we get the grant. Uh, we can actually start uh, doing the experiment. Uh, and on the way to this uh, ultimate goal of making the quantum computer better, you can actually uh, get like the interesting results. Uh, well, a little bit be, being a little bit sidetracked, but actually do something interesting. Uh, and um, uh, so there is a lot of marketing in this field. Uh, in sense of real progress, uh, yeah, the progress is happening. It is uh, getting better, but there is there are a lot of challenges still. Uh, so I think that uh, to make it clear for the community, and you don't need to trust me because I'm kind of, even though I'm from quantum uh, computing field, I'm not working directly with the uh, digital quantum computers. I was working with uh, quantum simulators that is slightly different. Um, so um, the hope is that as I have all the connections in the both uh, theory and experimental groups, I can actually talk to people that are building that, uh, ask about their opinion about particular uh, progress that they are making and how the whole uh, field will evolve. And also uh, we need to make it clear how exactly quantum computers will break, break elliptic curve cryptography. Because everyone is saying that, yeah, there's, um, uh, this uh, factoring algorithm, uh, Shor algorithm, is breaking all these problems, including elliptic curves. Uh, but I actually never uh, saw, uh, I should probably look it up, uh, how exactly it helps to break our cryptography, Bitcoin cryptography. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we can put all these opinions of the people that actually are working in this field together uh, and uh, write some kind of, uh, I don't know, medium post or something uh, that makes it clear without all the marketing bullshit, yeah. I think that would be very valuable. So it is like on, on the roadmap, unfortunately, as it is more like a... Um, a little bit side project, right? So it's like not <laughs> not directly uh, uh, related to uh, my current work. Uh, it doesn't uh, have all my attention, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, working in this direction. So okay. hopefully we will also uh, make some kind of review in this field. But my personal opinion is that uh, quantum computers are not a threat for Bitcoin for another, let's say 10 years. And it is way more dangerous to go into quantum altcoins uh, because uh, their cryptography is uh, not so mature because all the post-quantum crypto is pretty new. And you know what happens with the new crypto? It's mm -hmm. got broken. And if you, and by classical computers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm, you need to think twice about going there. Exactly, yeah. Stefan, can I ask you, I mean, do you think there's a distinction between more or less publicly uh, accessible or published, you know, scientific research and technological development and advancement and the military corporate industrial complex, black budgets, DARPA? I mean, or mm -hmm. is that some, some kind of, you know, cons uh, I mean, do you think there's uh, uh, like, because they have, the, they have the funds. I mean, we're talking about billions and trillions flowing into this project. What do we know? What are they really developing? I mean, this is not disclosed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is not disclosed. So I, I, it is also not disclosed to me. So I don't know about <laughs> true power of this, but uh, so what, what we can say. Uh, so we got some information about this uh, through other, um, agencies uh, from Edward Snowden and uh, also this NSA uh, pack of devices. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we see that uh, basically, uh, even though they are, uh, they have better funding and uh, so on, they are not like, uh, using some crazy toys like what uh, Avengers movie is sh showing us, right? Uh, so it is just one step ahead. Yeah? Uh, so for example, uh, they can put into the, I don't know, USB drive, uh, a tiny chip that will inter uh, intersect all the, all the communication and act as a man in the middle and even maybe send an SMS over the air to, to, to them, right? Uh, but uh, we can do it with current technology and we just uh, actually after publishing all this uh, stuff people started building these things so uh, there is even a website and a safe place set or something uh, dot com where they have projects uh, that look very similar to what NSA have uh, on the uh, academic research and like this uh, state of the art thing um, well in uh, general cryptography, 
uh, we do not trust the standards that NSA and other companies are suggesting us. Mm -hmm. This is, for example, why uh, Satoshi was using uh, the elliptic curve sec P to 56K1. This is a not, not NIST approved because the constants there are clear how they were chosen. So like all the constant in the cryptographic um, well, all the definitions basically. Uh, and in the NIST approved curves, there are like magic numbers everywhere. And, uh, you know, in cryptography, if someone picks a value, uh, some number wisely, they maybe can hack it. So there might be backdoors. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but so assuming that in the elliptic curve uh, cryptor that we are using, there are no backdoors. Uh, regarding the quantum computers, uh, I think that they may be, let's say, uh, one step ahead again. Uh, so this means that uh, if uh, the whole, uh, all the world uh, is currently playing with 100 qubit uh, quantum computers, they are working with 1,000 uh, qubit quantum computers, and we need millions to break. Mm -hmm. yeah? okay. um, so I think uh, I think that I told you know, about that in uh, Stefan's podcast, but I will repeat myself. Uh, I think there will be canaries that there is a progress in quantum computing, that we will see the progress in other fields, in uh, artificial intelligence, in uh, material science and others. Uh, so we will know that quantum computers are coming and uh, maybe we will have enough time to react to that. Uh, but at the moment, no signs of that. So I think that we need to keep thinking about that. It, I'm not saying that we just need to forget about quantum computers and that's it, but like keep it to the uh, protocol developers, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Keep it to cryptographers that are building the stuff. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is evolving slowly, right? So we don't, uh, we are uh, responsible for the money uh, like billions or what is the evaluation of Bitcoin right now? I don't know. This are the uh, number. Hundred fifty. It's changes constantly. Hundred fifty. Hundred fifty. Yeah, so like Two hundred maybe. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty big amount of money, anyways. Uh, so uh, any reckless change in the protocol level would be really crucial uh, like really uh, well really bad yeah so we can even support uh, this quantum altcoins a bit such that we can actually push the uh, the development of all this crypto uh, a little bit further because it is always better to have some funds as a uh, bounty uh, mm -hmm. for people to break quantum right. Quantum exactly. algorithms. Yeah, so I I think that it's great that we have uh, quantum altcoins because mm -hmm. then uh, people that can break their uh, quantum algorithm can actually get some profit from it. Yeah, so more incentive. Uh, to incentive, do yeah. exactly. Need to be tested and challenged. Totally with you. So Stefan, yeah, thank you so much. I, my listeners, I'm, I'm sure we learned a lot. It's really enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Is there anything you want to add, or I mean, where we, I'm going to put your, you know, Twitter handle and everything on the show notes. But is there anything uh, you want to, you know, add, or or where you, they can find you additionally? Uh, well, uh, m mostly I'm active on Twitter. Like I mm -hmm. tweet once per couple months <laughs> <laughs> okay got it yeah i see that <laughs> uh, yeah so uh just because uh, i don't know i have stuff to do yeah uh, and uh, every time when we announce something we announce it uh, through twitter so the uh, following me there is uh, already good enough and um at the moment i don't really have anything else to add but just uh Keep an eye on uh, our progress. We will release a few interesting things soon. And uh, yeah, also, if uh, any one of your listeners have any questions or suggestions or whatever, I have uh, the DMs open on Twitter. So oh, well, that's much appreciated. Anyone, anyone can, can write me. Yeah. Great. That's important, yeah, to know. So, Stefan, thank you so much. I hope to, you know, have you maybe next time in the new future on a panel discussion. Maybe we we even we might even see each other in Riga. Um, it's not sure yet, but uh, on I'm Honey Badger going, Conference. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, I'm actually going to Scaling Bitcoin to Tel Aviv. Uh, and, really? Uh, wow. And Dev++ Plus Plus, uh, before that. So, I'm giving a half an hour talk there about the hardware security. Uh, but my business partner, Morris, is going to Baltic Honey Badger. Mm -hmm. So we will okay. be in the conference. But, uh, Happy to meet yeah. him. Uh, 
maybe you will meet him and uh, chat with him. And do okay. a awesome. short interview. Stefan, thank you so much. Yeah, Talk to you soon. You. Bye-bye. Have a uh, good day. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stefan. Bye-bye. Welcome to the podcast show by Kei Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Awesome Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin.